First of all, good evening, and thank you for being here tonight. I begin by honoring the indigenous people on whose stolen land we meet. I also want to mark that we are, yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the massacre of students in Mexico. And uh, it's really important to this was part of the 68, which is the topic what we're organizing here. And this is also part of, uh, uh, on, on, last night we actually had a very, very, very engaging event where we screened the film uh, Symbols of Resistance about the Chicano, Chicana movement with Claude Marx, one of the makers of the film, and we had a very lively discussion. It's all available online if you're interested. We stream live all our events, and we stream live it because we want to share the discussion with everybody around the world. We have no other resources but to use open classrooms to do that, but also it's also guarded against people who might like to doctor. Uh, I just want to frame the event tonight and say what we're going to do. This is a class, Palestine Ethnic Studies Perspective, uh, and uh, this is a class that fulfills multiple uh, general education requirements, social justice, global perspective, there is speech here, global perspective, American ethnic and minority relations, as well as upper division in the social sciences. And uh, we try to do as many public events, open classrooms as possible. And part of the reason we do that is because we believe that knowledge, while it is mainly produced by people in the academic institution, is not produced only by people in academic institutions and does not arise with, originate with, or end with people in academic institutions. That we in academic institutions, our job to produce knowledge for justice, to listen to our communities, to incorporate what members of our community say, and to be accountable to the communities from whose lives we build our academic careers. So this is part of our community university engagement. As we say all the time, there is always community university engagement. It's just a question of what sort of engagement we're talking about. So even if the universe does not engage with the community, that is an engagement. That is a political position that basically says that we in academic institutions are neutral. And we know that when you are neutral in the face of the status quo and the face of injustice, you're basically perpetuating injustice. There is neut neutrality in this sense is complicity. So that, that really doesn't exist, it's a farce. And many times people say that you are doing, dealing with controversial issues, and we say all issues are controversial in one topic or another, and all issues are not controversial. All issues are issues for us to understand, to deal, to critique, to think about critically with each other, to engage, grill again and again and again and again, and then when we think we have the answers, we don't have the answers. We come back and we learn again, and we read, and we hear from each other, we hear from our members of our communities, and we engage with each other. In Palestine, Palestinian prisoners say prison is a university because people, and this is not just in Palestine, this isn't what people say in Palestine, but we know from the history here in the United States, we know from the history from people around the world that people do learn also in prisons and engage in prisons and they come out of prison. We have multiple experiences, including some of the people who've learned in prison and some of the people who've been engaged in prison solidarity groups with Palestine. So this is something really, really important to learn. It's also this, this, this class and this event tonight is part of the project we call Teaching Palestine, Pedagogical Praxis and Indivisibility of Justice. And we started this project in spring 2016 in anticipation of the year 2017-2018 academic year in which there were multiple anniversaries in the history of Palestine. We were marking people, we were marking the 50th anniversary of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, Sinai, Golan Heights, and East Jerusalem in 1967. We were also marking the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, the promise by which British colonial authorities have given Palestine a land to which they did not have rights to the Zionist movement and just legitimized the Zionist, uh, of the Zionist movement, actually. And as a result of the Balfour Declaration, you're supposed to be coming here because you're speaking. Yes, you, yes, I discovered it. And so this is also a part of the, 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 the that's what happened in 100, 
100 years ago on November 2nd, 1917, we also marked in 2017 the 30th anniversary of the 1987 Intifada. People call it the first Intifada. I don't like first, second, and so on because for a couple of reasons. One is that this whole thing about like even the waves in women's studies and so on doesn't really work very well. It doesn't really match with people's struggle. It matches some kind of very neat organization of history, but people's history is very messy and very and, and falls outside of that. It also tells us a certain history for certain ways in which dominant understandings uh, take place. But people who are challenging that, it doesn't work. But even in terms of the, saying the first Palestinian Intifada entails, implies that there has never been uh, a resistance in Palestine before. And we know, at the very least, and next week I'm going to invite you to come on, on, uh, on uh, Tuesday, at the 4 p.m. right here, we are actually having a big discussion in the course Comparative Border Studies Palestine and Mexico about the history of Spain, the history of the Spanish Civil War, about 1936-39, about the history of the Catalonia independence. Two days ago was the anniversary of the referendum of last year, about the history of Basque, that the Basque movement as well as Garnica which was bombed to smithereens. Franco's fascist government bombed Garnica to smithereens because it was the Basque area. So it also recalls what happened in Second World War when the only country that was an enemy of the United States was bombed with nuclear bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Iran, and the, indigenous, and the, the Japanese people were placed in concentration camps here. But, no, but the United States did not bomb Nazi Germany despite everything. So we need to also think about the European rules and the Eurocentric conceptions and so on. But so next week, we're actually going to be comparing what happened in Palestine 1936-39, the 1936-39 revolution, as well as the 1936-39 Spanish Civil War. And the connection with comparative border studies, Palestine and Mexico, is that we don't start from Trump and the wall the wall of death that he wants to build on the border between the US and Mexico and the apartheid wall that Israel has built in Palestine. But we actually go back to 1492. And we think about the ways in which the so-called discovery, when a man got lost and ended up in the wrong place, actually was the same time as the inquisition and the expulsion of Muslims and Jews from Andalusian Spain. So we want to be able to think about how all these histories come together. We don't conflate histories. We don't think same things are the same. People's struggle are not exactly the same. But there are ties in which we can think about what lessons do we draw? How do we connect histories together? In which ways we can look at comparative and contrasted studies. Not everything is exactly the same, but there are things that we can draw, specifically for our studies, questions of justice and injustice. And Ahmed studies program, if people do not know, you need to check. Everybody in my classes knows, because you all are supposed to study the minor, and you get quizzed on it. So you study the minor, right? Because there is. But we, you know that we are a program that is justice-centered, that we do not approach knowledge in sort of Kantian disinterested or Weberian value-free sociology or something, we actually do believe that there are values. We learn everything, we study everything, we discuss all sorts of material, and we end up thinking about what does this mean for questions of justice, especially because we are on a campus that talks about social justice, mm -hmm. that has claimed social justice, that has argued for that. The other anniversaries that I would like to bring up in the history of Palestine, please come, there is space here and there are spaces in the back as well. In the history of Palestine is that 2017 also marked the 10th anniversary of the blockade of Gaza. And this is when actually Hamas, as a political movement in Palestine, won elections, fair and square, I got the majority of the Palestinian Legislative Council within an Oslo framework, which is something else we will discuss Maybe not today, because this is not exactly the focus, but we will discuss it throughout the semester, and we've discussed it. And this has been a blockade imposed on the people of Gaza that is starving the people of Gaza, deprived them of electricity, of water, of resources, not to mention there have been four, so far, major Israeli wars. There are small ones that are wars of attrition. Four Israeli wars against Gaza, 2008, 2009, 
by the way, and each one of them has connections local at San Francisco State University, and we can even track 2008, 2009, cost us the loss of our searches for the Ahmed studies. 2000, uh, uh, 2012 was engaging, beginning the stuff when President Wong came, who just stepped down on, on Monday, and we can have a discussions about it. Many of us have things to say, and we can <laughs> say it in the discussion. And in 2014, actually, this is when the, the attacks escalated against uh, the program, basically strangled it together. And more recently now, we have the whole saga on Zionism, is that we say Zionism is racism, and we were um, took issue with President Wong and the position of the university. Anyway, we can talk about all of this. How do we track local and international issues that are always constructed as if something that we shouldn't care about? Because people in the US, and specifically people in ethnic studies, and people of color, and indigenous communities, and marginalized communities, it is not their business to learn about international issues, because we don't have the expertise. We don't have the standing. That should be given to people who have foreign policy expertise, and graduate from elite universities who are in Washington think tanks, and the State Department, and so on. And thus, we get excluded from the discussion of issues that are not only very important to our lives, but there are issues that affect our daily lives, day in and day out, both in material and in material uh, interests. 2017, 2018 was also the 70th anniversary of the UN partition of Palestine. On November 29, 1947, the United Nations partitioned Palestine. Later on the day became the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. 2000, uh, 2017 was also the 35th anniversary of the Sabra and Shatila massacre and the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And last week, we had an event here in class. We saw a film, an Israeli film called Waltz with uh, um, Bashir on the massacre, which was quite heavy. It was made by an Israeli um, filmmaker who was a soldier who actually served in Lebanon and could not remember being at Sabra and Shatila at the time the massacre happened. But he did remember killing 26 dogs who were uh, barking and giving announcement that the Israeli soldiers are advancing. And there is a whole discussion about it <coughs> and so on. So this is very interesting to kind of like think about what was going on. And finally, two other anniversaries in 2018 that we marked last spring. The first was the Deir Yassin massacre on April 9th, 1948, 2018. And we collaborated with another class in, uh, here in the college where we came together talking about 1492 to, 19, to, to, 1492 to 1948. And we brought in the discussion of indigenous communities here with the discussion of what happened in Palestine and why massacres happen. What is just to think about what happened at the massacre in Mexico, what happened with Garnica, what happened with massacres in the Philippines? What happened with massacres against the Palestinian? What is the message that massacres deliver? Mass scale killing. And if we want to think about also, we can bring in the other massacres on large scale, like the Holocaust, six million Jews were killed in Second World War, like the killing of the Romas, of the uh, queer people, of 20 uh, million Soviets, like the, the, the incarceration of, of, of Japanese people, <coughs> like the, the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If we think about what do massacres, what is the message that massacres intend to do? Send the message to people who are resisting <coughs> that you, your narrative is not a narrative of resistance, but it is a narrative of subjugation, submission, and defeat. Do not bother to resist, because you will be defeated, one. And tell everybody else who are supporting the people who are resisting that it is not worth it to invest your time and resources to resist and support people who are resisting, because they're going to, this struggle is wasteful, so don't waste your time. Move on to something else. Be more pragmatic and move on to something else. The interesting thing and the amazing thing about human creativity is that no matter how many massacres happen, people keep rising. And that's the question that we need to ask. Why is it that people keep rising? Why people keep rising and people, people keep saying, we're not going to stop? And we can take to social, to turn to social movement theory and think about why is it that people rise? Why is it that people continue? Because it is people like want to have freedom. People want to have justice. People want to have dignity. People want to have food on the table. It is very simple. 
Palestine is not exceptional. Palestine is not something different. Palestine is like any other people, Palestinians like any other people, engaging in trying to survive, trying to have a dignified life. And no matter what anybody tries, and the recent stuff well, we've heard was from Trump, not too long ago. Uh, Golid, there is a space over there. Get it over here, if you'd like. Uh, we heard an attempt to liquidate the UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency of Palestinian Refugees, which we had a very big discussion about it last week. Please check out the, the live streaming of the Sabra and Shatila commemoration. Tried to do it, and that's because on May 15th, 2018, the 70th anniversary of the Palestinian Nakba, when over 750 to 800,000 Palestinians were expelled. Palestinians in Gaza were going to the border and basically saying, we're not going to accept this life. We're going to continue resisting until we're able to go back home. We want to go home. We want the right to return. And what Trump has done is basically says, we need to liquidate United Nations Relief and Work Agency because he thinks by liquidating that, they can liquidate the United Nations card, refugee card, and thus end Palestinian refugee reality, and thus Palestinian quest to return. Hasn't worked. In Oslo, there was trying to deferment of the Palestinian refugee rights to 1999, the five status resolution. Didn't work. People thought that Palestinian refugees' rights are going to go away. And Palestinian refugees rose and protested and continued, and next week, on Mar uh, October 8th, at uh, Eric Casada Center, as well as the Roxy Theater, the indigenous, the eighth annual indigenous film festival, which is organized to mark the 50th anniversary of the American Indian movement, will be showing two films, including the other films that are being shown, including a film on the Standing Rock, the Warrior Women, Madonna Thunderhawk, and so on. We have two films about Palestine. One is about Ahed Tamimi, the young, kid who was arrested and for slapping an Israeli soldier for occupying her land, standing up for her right, basically. Very simple. Not really that difficult to comprehend, OK? Doesn't really. Palestinians are also not exceptional. And Palestinian women are not accepting to be docile and submissive and accept everything. So she, she slapped the soldier who was in her land. Anybody who is, gets attacked, uh, uh, a sex, uh, se sexual harassment victim, fights back. A rape victim finds a rapist. It is understood. But in this sense, there is all this. So we're going to have a discussion, but also more relevant to the question of refugees that we're going to be showing a film called Fro uh, Dreams of Fro Frontiers of Dreams and Fears about uh, two groups of Palestinian children, refugees, from two refugee camps in the West Bank, Daesh, and uh, from Beirut, Shatila, mm -hmm. meeting at the border, the Lebanese is uh, Israeli border or the Lebanese Palestinian border and meeting in 2000 and affirming their intention to return and their connection to return. So the reason we didn't show it uh, when we marked the Sabra and Shatila massacre is because we are going to be showing it at the Indigenous Film Festival. And we're actually quite honored that we were asked to participate. Bill Means, a co-founder of the American Indian Movement, will be there participating. So please join us. So these are some of our upcoming events. And on November 1st, just save the date, is going to be the anniversary of the Palestinian Cultural Munar Honor and the late Professor Edward Said. It's organized by the Gen Union of Palestine Students and the Cesar Chavez Student Center. And this year's anniversary is going to be focusing on Jerusalem, rightly so, to discuss all aspects of Jerusalem. So it would be really great to join us. So the reason I mentioned the last thing about the indigenous uh, film festival and about the American Indian movement is because here on our own campus, there was a student named Richard Oakes who was part of the takeover of Alcatraz by the American Indian Movement. And the reason I mention that is because I want to lead to the introduction of these amazing people who are here with us today. Because this was part of an international movement in 1968. It is, I mean, people can say 1967, 1969, 1960, 19, the date in itself Sometimes it's not as important as the events around it. But in 1968, miraculously, the whole world rose. There were uprisings, and just so we wouldn't think it was only in the US, and I know my uh, colleagues, comrades, sisters, and brothers here agree with me. It wasn't just what happened at San Francisco State. 
And it wasn't more important, what, what, what people think more important, what happened at Columbia University. Because God forbid we think about San Francisco State, a public campus, that as important something as Columbia University. But there were uprisings around the world. As I mentioned, yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the massacre against Mexican students, where at least 500 students were killed, and we do not know how many more. Uh, there was a, a big uprising in France that basically was collaboration between the students and the labor movement and shut down France. And now there is continuing uprising today, more, protesting all of the, uh, all of the uh, neoliberal policies and all of the conditions at the universities and so on. There was a huge uprising in Mexico, and I said Mexico, in Tunisia, in Senegal, all around the world, in Palestine, we mark this is the period of the Palestinian resistance, which we can speak about that some more when we have discussion about that. This was the period when people were challenging again. Again, it wasn't the first time. There was another cycle of challenging the status quo and saying, we're not going to accept Vietnam. We're not going to go fight for Vietnam. We're not going to fight for people, as Muhammad Ali said, I'm not going to go fight for anybody who, who never called me the N-word, okay? This was the, in, the, the connection between us at San Francisco State and San Fr California State University is also what happened on October 16, was it? Uh, 2000, uh, no, 1968 at San, uh, in, in, the, in the Olympics. It was October 16th, right? In the Olympics in Mexico City. Because Mexico was trying to present the Olympics as the signaling of Mexico as a modern, non-indigenous, non-third world, non-Latin American country. And thus, they suppressed the students in Mexico. Right here, next door, not very far away, San Jose State University expelled two students who stood up at the Olympics. Tommy Lee Tommy and John Smith. Carlos, Tommy Smith, Tom, Tommy Smith and, and, and John Carlos that stood in the Olympics, raised their fists, protesting, like Colin Kaepernick did in 2016. It's been going on for a very long time. And they stood without shoes. And they put around themselves scarves to signal the, sla the, the chains of slavery. <coughs> And like Handala, they stood poor but proud, witnessing history. What did San Jose State do? They expelled them. They expelled the students. Today, interesting enough, we were last week at San Jose State. San Jose State had just announced that they're going to give an award to uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. They're going to honor them. 50 years down the line. Of course, it's very useful to honor uh, now to claim something that happened in 1968 where people were punished. They were stripped of their Olympics. They were investigated by the FBI. They, were, they lost their livelihood. There were multiple things that happened to them. But today, they are heroes. And this is, leads me to introduce the people on this panel. The people here, and we're really proud as Ahmed studies, through our project Teaching Palestine, Pedagogical Praxis and the Invisibility of Justice, to have this amazing panel. Perhaps it's the first time, right? That uh, the 1968, there were a couple of events in the summer, that the 1968 strike of San Francisco State University is going to be commemorated right here in the College of Ethnic Studies, in the conference room of the College of, because if they had not done what they had done then, we would not be here today. There wouldn't be a College of Ethnic Studies, and there wouldn't be an Ahmed Studies program. Because we are inspired by the spirit of 68. We are, we frame our struggle in this context. We believe that we are proud inheritors of that legacy, and we continue it. So without a further ado, I'm going to have my colleagues from the strike of 68 speak. We're going to have the president of our union, uh, California Faculty Association proudly speak, and then we are going to open it up to you to ask questions, to raise uh, issues, to also engage in intergenerational conversation, to engage in core oral history, our oral history project, compile oral history narratives, and think about what were the lessons of 68, what can we do today, 
Is it the same? Exactly the same. We had this discussion yesterday, but there is many more discussions need to happen. What they, how they did what they did? Who was there at the table at the time? And how did they succeed? I am uh, the eighth man on the strike list. The gentleman to my right here, Terry Collins, got me in the school. Uh, I'd left back east. I was in the Black Panther Party back there, doing some organizing, came back home and they wanted to draft me. They went through my neighborhood the third time, and Terry got me into college. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> got it. And Terry had the most effective anti-draft program in the United States. In the United States. You gotta give everybody their due props in terms of creativity and innovation. We had a group of creative, innovative men and women that were here on this campus that created and didn't steal from each other. Uh, that's the problem. I've had MDs put their names to my work and run off with money and screw it up. It's so academic. Oh, you know, we have this front about academia, but let's get to the truth. Um, I. Um, when I became chairman, it was after the strike. Either everybody was uh, in jail, <coughs> deported from the country, graduated finally, or kicked out. I've had some friends, and Margaret can also talk about some of the African students that were with us were then executed when they returned back home for being part of the student strike. I had a brother from South Africa who I helped raise funds with, Pule. He was with Papo and they were to the left of the ANC, and he was executed as well. So people died for this. People's careers were destroyed for this. And it breaks our hearts to see what this has become. It breaks mine for what our vision was, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I was so lucky. Uh, how many of you, for the current students, been in Thornton Hall, physical science building? Okay. Anybody, anybody know who David Thornton is? Black man. Physicist. See his fat face, black man. We walk through the hall, third floor, you'll see this picture of him. Dr. Th I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Thornton when I was 17. My buddy, Tom Shelton, uh, who was a better scholar than me, I only studied chemistry and politics. Time had a better rounded uh, approach. Uh, took me down here, we snuck in and uh, heard his lecture. And Dr. Thornton said, everything is a mathematical problem. The question is, do you understand the problem so you can select a formula to solve the problem? We have too many damn people talking about the problem and making a living off of it, but not solving it. We need problem solvers. Just as H. Rap Brown wrote in his book, Die, Nigga, Die, we need, out of black studies, about ethnic studies, thinking men and women. That's what you must be, thinking men and women, not robots following orders. We don't need any more Eichmanns following orders. We need thinking men and women. We need each one of you to graduate not just graduate, but go on to graduate school and go get your doctorate. I'm after that. Because we need you to be in policies. I'm blessed. Four of my road dog and one ex-girlfriend are, are all physicians. So when my parents were dying, I had a team of doctors looking after my parents with love and compassion. I may have run a hospital lab, but I am not a physician. We need you to graduate. We need you to be thinking men and women. As what public enemies say, don't believe the hype. I'm old school, so <laughs> I know. I'm old. I'd always want to be mailed into the temptations, but didn't get into that. Now, after what we did, I went through, I'll give you my little, a little quick history. Uh, when I came in, was, I'm the eighth man on the strike list. Afterwards, uh, Everybody was gone, so all I had was the keys to the office and the office files. So I read every piece of paper in the office. I went through 
three different central committees before we finally came up with a group of men and women that would hang in there. As we talked about the FBI and stuff, I used to live on rent. Well, met my road dogs up uh, I living on campus because I had to leave home because my parents didn't want me coming out here getting involved in all this stuff after I just escaped from getting killed back east. Uh, of course, I had to come out here. And so I lived in the dorms, and so I ran into Ron Bentley, uh, Donald Craig, and Mike. Mike didn't make it through. He dropped out, but DC and Don did. Uh, Ron passed away a few years ago. Uh, DC is still with us. It's like when we get into these gatherings that you look around and say, who's still with us? Who, you know, you, you appreciate those who, who are still with you. And when you're going through these struggles, you're going to have debates and arguments, just like in families. You're going to argue with your brother and sister. I love my mama, but I did argue with her. <laughs> uh, tried to politicize her and bring her to a higher level of consciousness. And, you know, when you're young and dumb and trying to convince others <laughs> of it, you just learned it. Your damn self and fully have an internalized a philosophy of what it is you're trying to achieve. But you're searching for the truth. And that's important that you search for the truth in science, and I do now environmental science. <sighs> and I work, uh, a lot of my work in the last 25 years plus is in Bayview Hunters Point. I've been in Africa and in Asia, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Cambodia and Laos as well, and uh, Ghana and Nigeria. I got my graduate course in corruption in Nigeria, uh, trying to clean up uh, some of that. Um, but what we were trying to do here, what I read in the documents with Marion, let's get to history, because I attended last semester uh, a lecture, 50 years uh, uh, of black studies. And sister in, in, in Africana Studies Department giving a lecture talking about Malcolm X was the inspiration for black studies. That's a bunch of BS, revisionism history. I could use some other adjectives, but I'll just leave it at that. The truth, this came out of the students. Mary Emma Wadi and James Garrett created what is known as, was known as Black Studies Program. Mary Emma wrote the literature and poetry courses. James Garrett wrote the political science and history courses. And I, me and my buddy Tom would sneak down here and fall in on some of the classes in the old HLL building. Do they still call it HLL? Yeah, something else. Something else, no. It's the same old building. <laughs> Ain't changed it. And we sneak <coughs> in. And because they didn't teach that in high school, they, they, I still had a history book with a Negro happily after half a day's work. Uh, they call it. Uh, it was a red book with the eagle, and they call it Freedom of a People. <sighs> this is in San Francisco. And the only black face you've seen it, George Washington Carver, and then you saw a slave eating a piece of watermelon on the porch. So when, they, when Jimmy was talking about before the Mayflower and talking about what was before this, that's a whole other world. Ow! Open up my little eyes and seeing this. I look back in retrospect, what did we create? Uh, Ron Bentley, Jimmy, and Mariam created black studies. They were advocating for it. They also had an experimental, uh, experimental uh, college, also had what a class is on what do you do if the police stop you? What are your rights? Other courses to teach you to survive in America. That's what an education, if it's supposed to be relevant, to do. Why are you here in the first damn place? Are you following the American dream? I'm going to give you some money and, and move. Who in the hell needs you? Our purpose was to bring your skills back to the community and serve the community and improve, whether you're on an international scale or domestic. I've done both in my career. And go forth and try and improve. Um, I, I work in the sciences more so now in my life. And I'd like to see more of y'all because I'm tired of being the only one in the goddamn room yeah. talking about <clears throat> issues that affect communities of color. Science is filled 
with racism. Traditional risk assessments, that's measurements that they measure in terms of chemical exposure. The medical model is a 35-year-old white male. Would you believe in America the first breast cancer studies were done on white men, not even on women? And that's still in place today on exposure, on radiation. Terry, I'll, Terry will talk about some of the things he's doing at KPU and the radio. And we'll be talking also about the radiation exposure over there at Hunter's Point. And I've been on that committee for 12 years, and I chaired the technical. I had the EPA grant for uh, four of those years. Uh, what we did, Ron Bentley and myself, the BSU, wrote the first master's of arts degree in black studies back in 71 and gave it to Injasani over there, who then threw it in the trash can, got rid of it, couldn't find it, because the faculty couldn't take it to the next level. The faculty couldn't. Uh, Garrett wrote a piece in Philadelphia some years back about the dummying down of we call it third world studies initially when it was developed, and then later the institution called it ethnic studies. Uh, that's a whole political piece and argument. But they dummy down the faculty. Because we had some brilliant scholars that started off. Nathan here, two doctors, mm -hmm. plus 26 professional fights, 25 knockouts. <laughs> so if you want to get in an argument, he can whoop you intellectually or physically, how you want to cut it up. Um, and his wife is just as brilliant. She would be on CNN News when they were first, she'd chop folks up left and right. And unfortunately, his sister's suffering from Alzheimer's uh, disease now. And it's breaking Nathan's heart to see such a beautiful, intelligent woman. But they were a team. They were a team. They were writers and scholars. Uh, some of our BSU leadership became faculty members. So we were at the cutting edge, and that it became a systematic. I see higher cow turn around semester after semester, fired the faculty. I was VP of the student body. They would not allow me to be president of the student body because we'd go buy some gun, go take AS money and go buy guns and kill all the white people on campus. I swear, this is the shit that was going on in the administration building. So I had to have a white person over me. And I had to discuss it with the Central Committee. Do I run? And what is my function and purpose for being there? Because it ain't about my ego. We turned around and said, OK. So I ran, got more votes than the president did. Uh, and that we then set up what you know today as the child care center. We swapped the land for the gallery lounge and swapped it for Meriwether land out there in Meriwether Hall. So that put that whole piece in with a flight and for affordability for mothers to go to school, because they didn't have that. We were the first to set that up. We were the first to set that up. Child care and dog rooms, the first approach. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go for the dog rights. <laughs> Lipping at, no, no, you take your dog and, and get it out the faucet over there. I ain't drinking out of it. But that's another joke. Uh, but then afterwards, we also then pushed for the uh, BA, uh, the MA. Didn't happen, but the one thing that is functional today is the Child Care Center. As uh, far as the School of Ethnic Studies, the strike affected every aspect of this campus, whether you were for us and what we were fighting for or not. It had an influence. It made you go boop to the right, or those who were on the right came and joined us on the left. Me being uh, the mad chemist, um, I was in the old science building, and I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, the head of the graduate division of uh, chemistry uh, was my teacher, Bryant Ramsey. And he saw I had a gift. I used to make moonshine in high school and got straight into <laughs> organic chemistry. And I just carried that on. And he pulled me into environmental chemistry. And uh, we did research based on what our philosophy of taking our skills and making an impact in our communities. You don't need a PhD to make a difference. The community needs your skills right now. 
We turned around and did sickle cell screening before they had any kits. Uh, we did fat titration on hamburger meat. We busted two stores in the Sunnydale uh, area that was selling hamburger meat, 70% fat and 55% fat to the community. And those suckers shrunk up like you wouldn't believe. And then we filed the data in, oh, and, you know, we had San Francisco State on it and all that stuff, and they busted them. So one store, that supermarket is gone. Used to be if you drive down Geneva's where Colonel Sanders was at, it's still there. And the other one, little uh, store, is still there, but they can't do their own hamburger meat. They've got to have it packaged. So you can't improve the quality of life. We, so Bryant made that part of adopted me talking to him in these long debates, and he hired me as his research assistant and uh, TA for the class. And I was doing research as a sophomore. And I just took that and ran with applying the knowledge into the community. And today, I do the same work. Um, I'm in Bayview. I'm doing um, particulate studies right now for, uh, in Bayview Hunters Point with the Air District, taking the youth of the community, high school students. And hopefully, I can get a few. A couple of my students from Berkeley, when I was teaching environmental chemistry and engineering there, uh, one of them was my treating physician. I got in a car accident. This woman ran into the back of my car. That's why I still drive my old Mercedes 2001. It got steel in it versus aluminum. And she looked, I'm, I'm bent over. I'm on Oxycontin and synthetic morphine. And she looked at me, and she was sh she short black woman. You taught at UC Berkeley. You taught environmental chemistry. You worked the shit out of me. <laughs> and if it wasn't for you and my mama, I would not have gotten uh, 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 into medical school. I'm blessed that you put your, my name and your mother's name in the same sentence. And she worked on me and cured me without drugs. She electrocuted my butt <laughs> and put heating pads and got my nerves to go back inside my spine. And I had to call my dean and said, George, I don't give a damn if we die tomorrow. We did it. We got women and women of color into science and medicine. I get to reap the benefits of this. I hope that you in this class go forward and go further with what the dreams and some others will elaborate on. Later in 1980, I came back as the Associate Dean of Ethnic Studies. Your current Master's of Arts degree in Ethnic Studies is what Wade Nobles and I executed. Uh, that is uh, the course description up there on that uh, that I actually put it, theory and practice. Every class we taught in the beginning was not just theory, but practice. How do you put your theory? Does the shit work? None of us are God. Any scientist must have a theory, a hypothesis, and then you do experiment to see if it's working. That's what we had here. He had law in the black community. Eugene Johnson and I defended welfare mothers. We had 118 cases. Between the two, we doubled up, and we won 98 of our 118 cases. The only reason we didn't win more because the mothers were so used to fighting by themselves and to have backup. Shit, let three of us lie on this one agent. We're going to get them. And Ben Travis, Judge Travis, had to study the law. So we knew what we were doing. These courses were what. We also then did the survey back then, and that 92% of the students wanted a master's, a joint master's in business, and a joint master's in. Um, Science. Didn't happen. I know. They told me I got to shut up. My <laughs> lectures used to go for three hours at Berkeley, and here and I ran over. Uh, hopefully, if they come back at me, I can go more in depth in terms of that, what we were trying. And also, I was also advocating for uh, a PhD when I came back on the Phil McGee as the associate uh, dean here as well. And I had cut a deal. A.C. Hilliard turned me on to Gian Su who then turned me on to the North African Consortium and cut a deal with uh, Gaddafi for $55 million. We we're going to have Angela Davis proofread the Green Book. I sent a couple of students over. But Ayani said, Ray, I'm going to go sign, have uh, Romberg sign this off for you. This is my Christmas gift to you. But your problem will be from black studies. We want you to go forward. We want you to use the money. 
you could expand the school and not be stuck to state dollars. Money market was paying 12.4% at that time. If you go, so what if it drops down to 10%? In three years, that's $16.5 million free. They did not understand the business of education. And they said, <laughs> they didn't understand, still don't. Wade Nobles was honest and said, still don't. And that's what's breaking our heart. They don't use right now, and I'll shut up, they don't use the extension division. That's a money maker that's going to waste. Uh, when Jimmy and I had me over at Vista College, now Berkeley Community College, I was, in, I was chair of the International Trade Department since I had three majors, um, that we turned around and we... All right, what she got to talk to? I know it's her class, though. I ain't gonna talk now. There's nothing but love here, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I'm going to call on Professor Market Leahy, who was a professor, served as a professor of international relations, who was extremely active in the strike, whom I've met also with everybody else in 2008 when we commemorated the 40th anniversary. There's a lot of questions that are being raised. Some of them will be addressed some of them in the future. So without further, and I'm going to tell you, let you tell the story, so I'm not going to tell it for you. So <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. A lot of people ask, how did the strike ever get off the ground? What did you do? How did you get there? And I want to focus on some of that tonight, as well as what we did get out of it and what we really didn't get out of it. So as your professor in the class was saying, uh, a lot was going on in 1968. The students were literally massacred in the Zocolo, the central square of Mexico City. And they're not sure how many died because the government sent in helicopters to take some of the bodies out. People never knew what happened to their children. If any of you were parents, you'll understand. That could be the hardest thing, not to know what happened. They were made to disappear. France, as was said, France was boiling. Nothing since the fights over Algeria had occurred like this. You had the students going out because their education wasn't relevant and there were cutbacks and they weren't getting what they thought they needed. And the unions went out at the same time because they were not getting what they needed to keep their membership alive. There were cutbacks. Cutbacks at the universities, cutbacks in the quality of life for workers. So that was going on. Um, in the United States, there was turmoil. The civil rights movement had moved beyond passive um, resistance, shall we say, into a more active resistance. I remember when Martin Luther King was murdered. I was sitting in the commons before they had that monstrosity of a student union here. And it is a monstrosity. Our design was turned down for a reason. It was set up to get people together, to make it easy for people to talk. That one is like one of those mice things that, you know, everyone goes around maze, in different maze, places. And maze. maze, thank you. You get older, you forget your words. <laughs> um, and if you have a rally here, <laughs> We had a speaker's platform long before Berkeley had the free speech movement. 
Uh, I'm always proud of that one. Uh, we were in the United States dealing with the whole issue of race. And what did it mean? How was it connected to everything else that was going on? How do you learn from people of other races what their condition is? Because you sure as hell didn't get it from your schooling. You were told a variety of lies. I taught international relations. You want to see lies. I loved having students from different countries in my class because I would mention something as happening like the Spanish Civil War, and they would know what I was talking about. U.S. students, they go, huh? <laughs> Didn't know anything. And this is a major event that occurred pre-World War II. That was a precursor to World War II. And uh, one of our professors here during the time before the strike, his father was the head of the uh, uh, Republicans, not Republicans like we have, the good kind that were rep <laughs> fighting for the Republic in Spain. He was head of the uh, brigades in Barcelona, Fernando Gerasi. Oh. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot going on. I came into San Francisco State, a naive little girl from the sunset. I went to Holy Name Grammar School and Mercy High School. And I also went to work as a meat wrapper when I was 15, because we needed the money. My dad died and, you know, you do what you got to do. So I had a very good education, but it was limited in what the scope was. But my education was also on the assembly line for wrapping meat eight hours a day. So I understood the problems of working and the conditions under which people lived. And I also realized you weren't being told anything about that at the university. After a sit-in here where one of the uh, Terry Hallinan, who became district attorney, surprisingly. Um, everyone else must have been token because Terry toked all the time. He got his head smashed in. So I called my uncle, and I said, don't worry, I'm fine. He goes, ah, you're just like your grandparents. I went, huh? I found out my grandparents are miners' union organizers in Montana. And those were heavy times for miners' union organizers. But these are things we were never taught. We had to find out and then try to piece them together ourselves. So that's the milieu in which we were living at the time of the strike. But on campus, Many things occurred before the strike that, the, that were necessary in order for the strike to come about. And it's important to learn the lessons of those. One of the first actions that was taken on campus was an action around the discrimination between two groups of students ones that were black, ones that were white. They were suspended without any due, hear due process hearings, just automatically suspended. And a committee was formed called the Movement Against Political Suspension, MAPS. That said, wait a second, this isn't right. You can't do that to people. And it brought a lot of people in. It brought me in. I believe that people deserve due process, right? Um, you have to start where people are when you're trying to organize. 
And we learned that very quickly because when we told the president that he, he had said that he would uh, let the white students back in before a hearing, but not the black students because they were violent. Uh, excuse me. Uh, like judging already, sir? And we told him, you don't uh, bring them back into the university by noon on December 6th we're gonna come and sit in on the administration building. And as usual, we marched from the speaker's platform up to the administration building, not the big one you have now. It was two stories. And the president's office was getting on someone's shoulders away from you, okay? They couldn't go up to the fifth floor and hide. But as people went up, they found they had locked the doors on us. But they were stupid. They put chains around glass doors. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Duh. Well, getting into the president's office, there were two people who I loved very much. One was John Tarasi, who's now dead, and the other was Fusaro Kalantari, an Iranian student who later on we had to get out of the country because after they finally got him, we fought like hell to keep the cops away from him. But after they finally got him, he was up in the jail being processed and I got a call in the bail office, I was bailing everyone out again, that Husserl had pins in, up his gums and down his fingernails. They had let the savak the Iranian secret police up. So we, I got him out, and my parents were dead, but they had left me a house. I put that up for collateral. And we took Hosero from in front of the jail right up to Canada. And now I understand he's still alive, I just found out. Um, but he goes back, he's still an organizer in Iran. Um, and I was just so happy to know he's still alive because he was a great person. And he knew the risk he was taking, but he stood with us and stood in front of us usually because he also had a temper and he'd go to the front to fight the cops. But we broke into the administration building. We kicked the doors in. And I'll be honest, I was scared shitless. <laughs> I walk up to the door and I see it broken and I'm going, okay, you go in, you're never going back. <laughs> I went in, naive as hell. But I was doing what I believed was right. What we didn't realize is that we had not organized the rest of the campus to understand what we were doing. We allowed the university administration to frame the discussion, not about the issues, but rather about violence. They were violent. They kicked in a door. Private property. Something else we're all brought up with, you know, everyone deserves the right to have their own private property. But we learned you, you got to work with other people. You've got to talk to them, and you can't talk to them in a fancy way with terminologies and advanced academic skills. You have to talk to people where they are. And then they'll move along. So the first lesson we learned was you've got to understand what you're doing and be able to frame the discussion around any action you take. Because if you don't frame it, the administration will. We also had sit-ins, et cetera. And the, 
the issues were very clear. San Francisco State was a working class college. We were at a university then. And the students were from just around the Bay Area. People knew their communities. San Francisco, people used to say, was like a small town. Uh, you'd meet someone at a party or something, and they'd say, I'd say, oh, where do you live? Where'd you, where'd you go to school? They'd tell you, and the first words out of your mouth would be, oh, do you know so-and-so? Because we all knew each other. Not everybody, but a lot. But what happened was because of the experiences of, these, of the people that were here and their connections to their community, we could frame what we were doing. We wanted a school of third world studies one that connected what was happening in this country to what was happening around the world. Too scary. <laughs> you now have ethnic studies. And I can remember the first time I came back and I saw ethnic studies, I thought, well, I'm Irish. You know, I'm a, that's my ethnicity. Where's the Irish studies, you know? Um, it's completely changed around. It doesn't... The name means something. And the fact that the name was changed means something. So you always have to follow up and follow up and follow up to make sure what you think you've won stays where you think you've won it. Because if they can undermine you, they will every time. No matter what country you're in, no matter what the administration is, those that have want to make sure that those that don't shut up. So what better to do? We don't want third world studies and all these connections. We're going to call it ethnic studies. Sounds a lot better. We wanted faculty here that, as Ray mentioned, were connected to their communities and would teach such that the students could learn what was important to bring back to their communities. Academia wasn't separate. So many of the professors that did not go on strike talked about the ivory tower and how none of these political issues should come into the ivory tower. It's like you were talking about uh, there is no such thing as neutrality. That's what they were trying to say. Well, if you think that way, not only is the administration going to undermine you, but they're going to undermine. They're going to fire the faculty that went on strike. They're going to support deporting people that were on strike. Jack Alexis is back in Trinidad. Um, he, he had to leave really quick. He got deported. Pardon? Yeah, Paul. Anyone who was international was deported. And if you came from a repressive government, Guess what would happen to you when you went home? We knew if Husserl was sent back to Iran, he was dead. Absolutely dead. Another thing you have to learn is you have to be willing to fight for what you want. And when I say fight, I'm not just talking about talking or having a sit-in. If you're serious, you're going to probably end up fighting physically because they will call in the cops. And you better learn how to defend yourself because just as they come into the communities, especially communities of color, and think that they can run rampant, 
So too did they come in here and think they could run rapid. We had San Francisco police, San Francisco sheriffs, highway patrol, San Mateo sheriffs. I don't know how many we had. We just had cops all over the place. Um, and what well, we did, <laughs> you know, they were all getting training, I guess. Um, but we had to defend ourselves. Hey, hey Sus Contreras, Chewy. Mm -hmm. You guys remember Chewy? Oh, yeah. He. Not the one who ended up in Chicago. Pardon? Not the one who ended up in Chicago. No, no, no. no. Hey, Chewy's yeah. unfortunately deceased oh. at now. But he took one look at me and he said, You never fought, did you? And I said, No. <laughs> he goes, Come on, we're going down to the gym. And he taught me. We went through weeks of how to block a billy club, how to do this, how to do that. I had bruises up my arms because Chewy was muscular. But you gotta learn, you gotta, if you wanna stand up for something, you gotta stand for it. And the more effective you are, the more repressive the regime is gonna be. And unfortunately, you're not gonna have that much support from the college here. Because most of the faculty, with one exception, have been brought in for their publications, their possibilities of getting grant monies, the regular academic rigmarole. We wanted faculty that understood the community. We didn't care what letters were after their names. And I always say PhD means piled higher and deeper. <laughs> and I can say that because I have one. Um, so we fought and we thought we won. Some things, not everything, but we thought we won. But we didn't. They were able to slowly but surely cut away at what was won. We wanted more admissions of students of color and people who came from poor communities where the educational system sucked. People had been working in the high schools here in the city to prepare students to be able to come in. so that they could then again go back to their community. I was shocked when I came back to state and I was teaching. My students were from all over California, a whole bunch from Southern California. They had no connection to their communities here. You know, the, well, the, the, the dorms or their roommates, you know, they, there was nothing to hold on to. So it's gonna be harder for you guys if you wanna organize because not everyone has the same kind of roots that you do. Um, but you gotta keep going. I'm 73 and right now I'm in a wheelchair for about eight more weeks, I hope, before I become again the bionic woman <laughs> with another implant. But I'll be damned. Once I get it out of this thing, I'll take my shillelagh, my Irish walking stick, and I don't care who comes. So you gotta be willing to continue as long as you live to do what you believe is right. Questions, how's that? And you know that, uh, yeah. I'll get there. By the way, I just want to say that we do have a whole bunch of videos that are available at the uh, San Francisco State uh, website, including many of the videos that we've organized as Ahmed, including some of the people who are no longer with us today, like Damira Ahmed, who was in the, in the videos in 2008, like uh, Javid, who was with the Malcolm X grassroots movement. We did a very big discussion. They're not listed under Ahmed somehow. They, Ahmed was removed and now they are listed under the College of Ethnic Studies. But I can direct you, we have a lot of things. We brought Yuri Kuchiyama to campus. We had a lot of stuff oh, that we was done. Things on remember? The yeah. Yeah. They yeah. love to say, 
we had a strike and we have a school of ethnic studies. You know, when they want to, and they want to look good and be the liberal college that claim to, well, they are liberal, liberal sit on the fence post and they push that the job, they go to the right. <laughs> So uh, next, and I'm, again, I, I'm, I hate to stop you, but you know, the, the conversation are going to continue. And actually, we know, the way we knew about Hosoros being alive is because a young Iranian graduate student was doing her PhD dissertation about the Iranian Student Association, which was very active in the 70s, and which was at the same time the organization of Arab student was active, which was also, there was a chapter on campus. And she wanted to interview and find out where Iranian students were. And uh, we, we connected her yeah. with Margaret. And you've, she interviewed it. And then she traced Hosoros and found out that he's still arrive, alive in Iran. So this is how these connections work. So don't just think about only one thing. There is a lot of connections that are really important. And then I'm going to move next to Steve Seltzer, who is today, he is a radio journalist. He's a union organizer. And he has been, we've met in 2008, right? Yeah. And we did all these activities together, and we've been organizing since. And Steve was very active with Local 10, right? Yeah. Uh, the Longshoreman Union, which is the first union in the United States that actually instituted boycott of Upper Side South Africa. And it's the first union that in the summer of 2014, the workers refused to cross the picket line and unload the products from Zim Lines, which was an Israeli line, right here in the Bay Area. So the connections are not just here. Just keep thinking about outside San Francisco State, outside of the US, in the world, how we can bring all these connections together. They're very real. They're not theor only theoretical or abstract. Without further ado, Steve. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank Professor Rabab Abdul Hadi for hosting this. And it's sad to say uh, that there are a lot of professors here that are afraid of having this kind of forum uh, because it's hot political potato. Now, my, when Margaret was talking about John Jirasi, that was my first like week on campus. <laughs> and I followed him and some other people up to the administration building. It was locked and he went alongside and broke the window and crawled in. So I said, well, this is going to be an interesting experience at San Francisco <laughs> State <laughs> for a student seeing the professor breaking in to an administration building. Great fear in Latin America. That's why he was brought here. He wrote this book about what US imperialism was doing in Latin America. And people wanted him to come here and speak about it. And he did. But he was doing more than speaking. He was acting to defend the students here and to fight racism on the campus. And that is of course, one of the issues uh, in the strike, and that was the fight against U.S. imperialism uh, with the war and the draft. Uh, there was a militant anti-war movement, and sad to say in the United States, uh, we have 800 bases, we're spending trillions of dollars bombing Syria, bombing Iraq, bombing Yemen, and there are no mass protests. So it tells you that we're in a situation in which there's quiescence, really, in people in this country, that they allow that to go on without any kind of mass protest. But San Francisco State, how many of you came to San Francisco State because of its, because of its politics? So some of you did. I mean, a lot of people came, in, including Professor, uh, and, and that's why I came, because it was a political campus, because it had a struggle. And one of the things in San Francisco, uh, there was a militant history in San Francisco prior to the San Francisco State strike. The Un-American House of American Activities Committee uh, actually had its ending in San Francisco because they came here and they thought they were going to put the communists on trial and hundreds of people went there and protested and they decided they didn't want to have any more show trials. That was the last one they had. They washed them down, but it, was, it turned into a, a, a backfire on them. What year? What year? Uh, 1960. 1960. There was a Cadillac Row where they refused to hire African-American salesmen on, on Cadillac Row on, on Van Ness. There were protests against that, forced them to hire African-Americans. The same in the hotels. The hotels were segregated in San Francisco. Palace Hotel, there were protests against that. So there were protests in the working class in San Francisco against the racism, the discrimination. Those were the kind of conditions 
that led to the San Francisco State strike. It came out of a movement of struggle against racism, against discrimination, against war. So th it didn't come from nothing. And of course, the formation of the Black Panther Party, which even if we have differences with it, was part of a movement, a movement against racial attacks on the working class, on discrimination and the brutality, which continues to this day and is expanding in this country. The murders go on every day. And you have black mayors and a black president, and they still go on. It's a system problem. That's what it is. It's not a, an issue of getting black politicians. It's how the system is organized. That's why these murders continue. So San Francisco had a large black community, relatively, at one time, because black workers were brought here to work in the shipyards in Hunters Point Bayview. And they also had a nuclear radiological laboratory there. They were bringing back ships from the Marshall Islands that had been contaminated by nuclear blasts and having African-American sandblasters blast these ships because they wanted to see if they can decontaminate them and use them again. And these workers were poisoned. They got cancer. They also had, they were testing them with nuclear tests at this radiological library, uh, laboratory right here in San Francisco. And today, I mean, we talk about the insanity. How many people would build a housing project on a radioactive nuclear dump site. Really? Leonard. Leonard. Yeah. Lennar, which gives money to San Francisco State. When we talk about the interaction between the students at San Francisco State and what the hell is going on in the community, there is no interaction. How many students are involved here in defending the African American community or the Latino community or fighting gentrification in San Francisco? They're kicking out the students. They're kicking out the workers. That's what they're doing in San Francisco. Ethnic cleansing and closing up working class rights to live in the city. So this was going on at that time. But as the speakers have said, one of the issues of the establishment of uh, the third world studies is for these st programs to be involved in the communities, organizing, educating, talking about what's going on in the community, fighting the gentrification, fighting the capitalists who own San Francisco. That's what we're talking about. Who do you think owns San Francisco? The billionaires. There are 30 billionaires in San Francisco. There are 124 billionaires in California. And you have to pay to go to college here? When I went, I was $72 a semester. $72 a semester. That's what you should be paying now. There's so much wealth in California in this country, and you young people have to go into debt, become paupers to go to public education in this country? It's a crime. It's a crime what we're facing, but this is accepted. This is what we have to take. This is what is being pushed. And that is part of the problem, because this struggle at San Francisco State strike was connected to the working class. In fact, Reagan at that time wanted to bring in the National Guard. He wanted to bring in the National Guard and crush this strike, which they couldn't crush with the San Francisco police and the highway patrol and everybody. We were organized and we were fighting back. He, but, but the thing is, the teachers here, AFT, AFT uh, 1352, supported the strike. And most of those, many of those professors lost their jobs because they supported the strike. They were purged. But they put their lives or their, their career on the line and they supported the strike and they got the San Francisco Labor Council to endorse it. They sanctioned it so all the other union workers went out with the workers here and the students. That made it powerful and also it complicated it for Reagan because if he'd called in the National Guard there was the possibility of a general strike in San Francisco mm -hmm. and that is something the capitalists are afraid of. They're afraid of general strikes. The last general strike was in 1946 in Oakland the reason is, not only are the capitalists afraid of general strikes, but the union leadership are afraid of general strikes. We have a corporate union, business unionism. We have a union that accepts capitalism. I mean, how can it be in the faculty union and the staff union and the students that there's not a united front to say we want free public education now? There's a $13 billion surplus in California and we don't have free public education in California? How is that? That's because people aren't organizing to close down campuses and having mass demonstrations in Sacramento to demand it, to say you get that money, our money, so that students can go to school for free at public colleges. That's what we have to do. But that only happens when you fight for it. 
It doesn't happen by asking for it. You have to fight for it. You have to go after these people. And these people have the power. They have the corporate control. You know, this thing at Hunters Point Bayview again. This is a national scandal. A billion dollars of tax dollars has been spent to so-called remediate, clean up Hunters Point Bayview. A billion. One billion dollars. And you know something? They were fraudulent testing and they haven't cleaned it up. It's still polluted. So the Chronicle has done stories, but there's no national stories on it. You would think that the Republicans who control the executive, Trump would be talking about Pelosi, because who's been covering it up in San Francisco? It's Nancy Pelosi, Dianne Feinstein, Gavin Newsom, and, and uh, Kamala Harris, who was the district attorney in San Francisco, an attorney general when this thing was going on, when whistleblowers were being fired for saying it's unsafe, it's dangerous, they're falsifying the tests. Nothing. So we have a situation of corporate controlled media that don't want to make the connections, that don't want people to know what is really going on right in San Francisco, right where they live. Now, I want to talk about Zionism because Zionism has a very powerful influence. And the fact of the matter is you have a Jewish studies here, which I have no problem with, with seven professors. That's fine. You have one professor who's under attack here. The one professor, Muslim American and Arab studies in, at, at San Francisco State, that is criminal. That's outrageous. Why is that? Because they want to crush these voices. They don't want people to talk about the reality of what Zionism is. That the United States is spending billions and billions of dollars to support Israel, which has the Palestinian community in concentration camps. That's what we've got going on. But the concentration camps there are not just there. They're on the border now of Texas where children are being put in concentration camps. That is what is going on in this country. But the, the control of the Zionists is massive, including in the unions. The idea that you can have a Jewish state. Since when do we support religious states in the United States? I thought we believed in equality, equal rights for all. If you believe in a Jewish state, do you believe in a theocratic state? Do you believe in a Christian state? Do you believe uh, in these kind of states? No! I support an equal, equal state, a secular state for all people. I'm against religious states. But for the question of Zionism, it's okay. It's okay to have a Jewish state. That ideology permeates this country, and it permeates the leadership of the unions, who say that they're for equality. No, they're not. When you support a Jewish state, you're not for equality because Palestinians and non-Jews are being discriminated against. You can't have equality in a religious state. So the attack here uh, against this program and against the prof professor who heads this program is coordinated and organized. And it, I was at a meeting here where the students were talking about Facebook being used to terrorize Palestinian students, that they were being terrorized, accused of being terrorists. And we'll talk about Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg is met with the Israeli government, and he brought on a Zionist to be in charge of censoring Facebook. And professors have been fired by uh, f uh, fabricated graphics, and, uh, uh, Nazi graphics on their Facebook page that they didn't even know about, and then they get suspended and fired. They have to fight for their job back. So we have a, the use of this technology is being used to go after people, to frame people. That's what's happening, and we have to understand and we have to be able to fight it. At the same time, the fact of the matter is, we have power. And we had power in the San Francisco State Strike. Right? That's why they were so afraid of us. We were organized. We got information out. I mean, we were calling people around the world when we occupied the administration building, talking about our struggle and connecting with struggles all over the world. We are part of a world movement. And we have power. But the way that the capitalists tell the people in this country is they don't have any power. They're powerless. They don't have any control about what's happening. They tell workers that they have no power and they can't control their factories. Well, the fact of the matter is, there has not been a mass working class movement in the United States since the 1930s and 1940s. There, the last general strike was in Oakland in 1946. Why is that? It's because the trade union bureaucracy, I believe, do not want general strikes. Because when you have general strikes, you have the collective power of the entire working class. When San Francisco was shut down in 1934, that showed workers you have power and you have the right to be in a union. Now, the capitalists said they were communists. 
communists taking over. In fact, that's their usual thing. The communists are taking over. The Reds are taking over. Actually, that strike wasn't over a socialist revolution. It was a right to have a union hall, which they want to get rid of. They don't want people to have unions. They want to crush unions. But the fact of the matter is the workers learned in that strike that they had the power and they could beat the government. They brought in machine guns and the National Guard into San Francisco. And we have a festival every July called Labor Fest to commemorate the San Francisco General Strike. We had an event on the, uh, on the labor in the San Francisco General Strike because working class history is unknown in San, in, in among working people. People don't know about the San Francisco General Strike. People don't know that May Day was established in the United States by immigrant workers in Chicago fighting for an eight hour day. That radical idea, which we don't even have anymore. When you have thousands and thousands of workers working two, three jobs, these drivers, Uber, dying on, in their cars, sleeping in their cars, they come to San Francisco because they can't find jobs. This is a system, the wheels are coming off the system, and Trump is a reflection of that. We're going to make America great again. No. No. Trump is escalating the decline of American imperialism. That's what Trump is doing. And the only way we will save this country and this world is by people taking control of it. That's the only way it's going to be saved. With climate, they want to destroy this world. Let's pump more oil. Let's produce more electricity. That is private control of the energy and utility industry. You can't solve the climate crisis without making it run by the working people, not, pro not for profit. These are problems of a system gone wild. This is really what we have in this country. And it goes back to what's happening in Bayview, Hunters Point, and you know, uh, Treasure Island, because the politicians in San Francisco, Gavin Newsom, the new mayor, uh, London Breed, they still want to build houses there. You ask, how the hell can you say we should still build houses when you have a billion dollars spent and it's still dirty? It's money. It's condos. People want to make profit out of it. So we have to fight the system, we have to be educated, and that's what they were afraid about in the San Francisco State Strike. We put out in SDS, who are the regents? Who are the trustees? Who do they represent? Where's their money coming from? There's so much money in San Francisco State. Where's it going? Who is it going to? You see, at, in San Francisco City College, they want to privatize Balboa Reservoir, turn it over to developers, Avalon. And unfortunately, there's a, a, a faculty member here, uh, Bridget Avila, who is in favor of that, of selling off the land, privatizing the land. What kind of ethnic studies department do you have when you have a faculty member who says we should sell off the land to private developers? Is that about protecting our public colleges? Is this what we have in this country, where people say, let's privatize everything, including public land, which should be for the public, for students? So this strike was important, and one of the things that is significant for you to understand, there's no class here on the San Francisco State Strike. You would think we have a whole department of ethnic studies, but they don't even have a semester class on the San Francisco State. We have to demand that there be a class on the San Francisco State Strike. We have to demand that, they, they, that every year there be a, uh, papers produced from the students in that class on what is important about the strike so that people can learn about it. It was an upheaval. It was a battle and a war. That's what it was. And those lessons are important for us today because there are battles all over. It's not just San Francisco. It's Palestine. It's South Africa. It's every country in the world, in Spain, in Puerto Rico. Every country, there are battles going on. And we're in a struggle, a global struggle. That's what we're in for survival. Now, one, a couple of things. One thing is we're Gavin Newsom. This is another thing about, quote, unquote, democracy. Democracy. You know, I don't support the Republicans, but the Republicans had a fight to get a debate with Newsom. Can you imagine that? You know, we're not going to have any more debates. Pelosi doesn't want to have any more debates. She doesn't want to have any more town hall meetings. They're afraid of the people, these politicians. They're afraid of the people. So this Monday at 9 a.m., Newsom and Cox, the Republican, are going to have a debate at KQED. Only debate in California for governor. Now, you would think that some of these issues that we're talking about here would come up. Hell no. Hell no. So we're going to have a press conference and rally to demand why the cover-up at Hunters Point Bayview is going on. Why a billion dollars has been spent in, in fraud. It's the biggest eco-fraud in the history of the United States. We're going to have a meeting, 2601 Mariposa. We invite you to all to come down there. We have to make the issues. Nobody, we, they are not going to make our issues. 
So the way you have to get your agenda out there is you have to fight to make the issue out front a political issue. In our strike, we made the issue. We have a right to know about our history. The people from the Philippines, the people from Mexico and Latin America have a right to know their history. The African Americans, the Native Americans, we have a right to have our history. That was one of the issues. The other issue is open admissions. Working class people, all people have a right for public education. Free. Free. That's an issue today as it's as more relevant than it is then. How many people can afford to go to college now on their own, pay their own way? Not working class students. Working class students are stressed out here. They're working two jobs. They're running around wild with their heads cut off. They don't want working class students and students to have time to think about things. They want you so rushed you can't do anything. You're struggling to survive day to day. That's exactly what they want, a temporary part-time workforce. And the faculty here is another thing, because the faculty, the adjunct faculty are oppressed. They're living in their cars. I mean, I was covering the CFA struggle for a contract. You had faculty speaking in Hayward State, which I was at. I mean, they, they were in debt, OK? They were in debt to get their PhD. And they didn't even have health care. They're part-time at the college. What the hell is going on? You're a faculty member of a university or a college. You don't even have health care, and you owe all this money you borrowed to be, get your PhD, to get your degree. This system is rotten, and it has to change. And we have to make it change, and we have to use our collective power to make it change. And we do have the power. And that's what we have to bring back and make relevant. It is relevant, and it's possible today. Before I turn it to the last speaker, I wanted to say SDS, Students for Democratic Society. That was very important, and people really need to learn that. And I mentioned a little bit about the, the May 68 in Colombia, and there is this whole discussions about some people having discussions about what happened, and then, but the histories are not all coming out, and it's really important to unearth the histories of the people who were involved. I also think that it was really significant that the American Federation of Teacher were, was very involved. And actually, this is something that we will come to back to our union and the ways the union is actually really doing the work that the union should I, be doing. I want to so make I want one to, comment. Yeah, go ahead. When Steve was saying that I agree that there has to be a chorus struggle. That chorus has to be, I don't want to say control, because that's the touchy word, overseen something by those who were in it. Because otherwise, as I was saying before, if you don't frame the issue, if you don't frame what the class is supposed to cover, if you don't do it, they will do it for you. And I would hate to see the faculty here doing it, because I had the head of Africana Studies tell me, whoa, you mean there were white people in the strike? <laughs> <laughs> Terry Collins. Well, basically, you got my tour. was in the Black Panther Party, in the Black Student Union, and in the Third World Liberation Front, without further ado. Terry. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, we ain't got too much more time, so I just like to from questions from from the from the students. But I'll make try to be got like two three minutes. Uh, <clears throat> the reason why we started our strike basically was to be honest. The Black Student Union, for example, created a central committee. I was one of the responsible for. I was 31 years old when I came here. I got here by Roger Robert taking me to the president's office and getting me in. I had no intention. I was in the Black Panther Party of Self Defense. We had about 20 people in at that time. And I joined in Richmond. Bobby Sue signed me. Bobby Sue signed me up in Richmond. And George Dow was my captain, who the brother of Denzel Dow was killed by the police in Richmond. Uh, Avacha brought me over there. Avacha, who is an artist, a poet, is the one who took me over to join the party uh, in July the 13th, 1967. So I was in the party before I came here. I hadn't been planning on coming here at all, not an intention. I happened to be standing out here one day. And Roger, Roger Alvarado came up to me and asked me, what, do you want to go to school? I said, what are you talking about? And he took me to the president's office and got me in school. So basically, I don't want to take too much time, but I want y'all to ask questions. But let me tell you how the strike started. There was a movie 
One thing is very important. We saw movies in them, them days that put, put, give us impressions. And I had to take me a rack of Panthers, as, as Joe Rudolph would call, to these movies. A rack would mean about five or more, uh, you know, rank and file. And the Battle of Algiers is one. Another movie was called A State of Siege. Yes. Another movie was called uh, 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 Z. Yeah. And another movie was, uh, let me get, let me, let me see. Is, uh, I think, I, ca I can't remember. Burn. Burn, 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 right, burn, right. So we was influenced, he was influenced by the arts, by the arts. When I was a youngster, I used to go to see movies with uh, Betty, B Betty Davis and uh, what's her called, uh, 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 Joan Crawford and uh, Peter Laurie. And I'm 81, 82 years old. I was born in 1936. So I, those kind of movies I used to go see gave me ideas about the world. I was born, I was, I'm from a little small town in Indiana. I was born in Michigan, but I was raised in a little small town in that 2, uh, 12,500 people, Connorsville, Indiana. And I went to school called Fifth Street School. In Fifth Street School, we had teachers who were all women and not married because they got married, they had to be housewives, so they refused to get married. And we were their kids, and they taught us. In the third grade, Miss Lyons taught me geography, and I knew every capital of every state. I knew every capital of every country, every river, every mountain in the world. So I was an internationalist in the third grade. <laughs> Being in a small town, you want to know these things because you're in a small town. But it was an industrial town, and what happened, I developed a class consciousness very quick because in this town came people from Appalachia. And in Appalachia, people worked in coal mines. West Virginia, most of them came from West Virginia, Kentucky, most of them came from Kentucky. And at a very young age, I developed class because I was around these people came up to, to the, from the mines, and their parents would run them out, tell them, you don't want you in these damn mines. You got to go up north, make some money in the, in the factories. And this little town I lived in Connorsville had a lot of factories. In fact, in the daytime, it was 25,000 people there because people came from the outlying areas to there. So everything was booming, you know what I mean? And so basically, a lot of the white people from Appalachia all lived in the places where it's toxic. A place called Edgewood. And I had an uncle, we call, everybody called, whether he was black or white, everybody was uncle or auntie back in them days. And I had an uncle named Uncle John who was black who had a store in Edgewood, right? So basically my whole class consciousness came from living in a small town. Now, the reason why this start, site started was in the Black Student Union. For example, when I first came here in 1967, there was Benny Stewart who was a chair, Jimmy Garrett was off-campus coordinator. Jerry Bernardo was on-campus coordinator. And the secretary was a Filipino sister named Glory Lowry. So I talked to the secretary. I know she had the information. So finally I asked VSU, what composes of a black student union? So you got to be black, right? And that's it. I said, no, shit ain't going to work. Uh -uh. <laughs> so I began to work on the concept of a central committee. And I didn't call the second part the presidium because I, call, I, didn't, call it, I didn't call it a politburo because people might not like that, so I called it the presidium, <laughs> Latin word. So I began on that concept. I worked for maybe you know about, about six years, not six years, I mean six months, five months, to get a central committee, which he had to take over after he ran us off. So basically our whole concept in the beginning was international. I was the oldest. I'm 31 years old when I come to school. I'm the oldest, right? I'm about 10 years older than most everybody, at least eight, you know what I mean, oh, most everybody. So in our central committee, we, 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 we created our ideology. We studied the Red Book. We studied Fanon. We studied uh, 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 Fierre. We studied, we studied, we even read stuff like uh, 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 Oscar Wilde to learn how to read, you know, novels and stuff. I mean, it, I mean, books, all books, for example, you read, don't have to be, because it can be reading novels by, for example, Hemingway and people like that and learn stuff. So basically, uh, I don't want to take too much more time because you ain't got too much time, but basically, when we started, when we started, when we started the strike, it was some, some, some reactionaries, black reactionaries wanted to kind of pull a coup on us. We heard they wanted to pull a coup. So Ronaldo came and said, man, they want to pull a coup. 
So I said, let's find out if the black student union, the black students are with us. Let's find out. So the Battle of Algiers, the first time we thought about it. Remember the Battle of Algiers? Mm -hmm. Right? They had a, a strike to see if the people were with the, 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 the National Liberation Front. So that's the, that's the concept of the strike. The, 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 the what you call it, the, uh, the, the, the demands, that was all in their head. We found out in 1950s, they had about 10% black students on this campus. In 1968, 67, they had 2%. So what the hell's going to What happened? We found that out through research done by Jimmy Garrett and Mariana Wadi. And I said, what? When I first came here, I hadn't started. Mariana Wadi had me doing draft counseling at her house. <laughs> and they hooked me up with a SNCC. They picked people in SNCC to learn from me. I didn't know shit. I was learning. I didn't know nothing. But I finally, after a while, there was some women called the Strike for Peace. Another woman who kept, kept on top of it was Yuri Kochiyama from New York. Mm -hmm. She stayed on me, <laughs> Yuri Kochiyama, right? Sent me stuff, information. And another person was a woman, Ida Stein, Women's Strike for Peace in LA. She sent me information. And after a while, we became two of the best draft counselors in the country. In fact, we was the number one. In fact, we had a, mm -hmm. a, two, a sister, two sisters, part Mexican and part Filipino, Anita Bayaka and Rosie Bayaka, who are the ones who were working with us. All we had to do, bring a brother in there. You don't care what color, but bring him in there and say, do you want to go to Vietnam? No. We asked them why. We write it down, send it to the draft board. They get one why. One why is some new stuff they created because of us. One why. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they didn't know what to do with it. So basically, you know, yeah, it's 10 minutes till, so you can just ask questions because I could go on because, you know, we're asking questions. Oh, just Thank you. Yeah. And we have, we actually did interview Terry back in, 19, in 2008, and we have been hearing from him ever since, but there is so much more uh, to say. I just wanted to say two things that Terry mentioned. SNCC, that Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was formed in the South of students who were organizing, many of them, including Strokey Markel, who became Kwame Turi, uh, Gloria House, who's Anab Kogatsili. Many people uh, were part of that. Um, they were mentored by Robert Williams, uh, the who wrote the book Negroes with Guns. So a lot of this stuff is actually going to come out next semester in my class, Colonialism, Imperialism, and Resistance. Third word movements, then and now. So it's in this is 620. <laughs> And also, and uh, Yuri Kuchiyama, for people who do not know, is the Japanese uh, international sister in whose lab Malcolm X died after he was shot. So this is just very small snippets. But and by the way, all the films that Terry is mentioned is going to be next semester also. <laughs> <laughs> so, just so you can all join out. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so without further ado, government. and last but not least, is the president our leader? And he's not really this union bureaucratic demo, uh, bureaucrat. He is actually a man of the people. Uh, James Martel, as I've met him in 2016, as the co-chair of the faculty rights uh, panel in, in the California Faculty Association, he has really had my back. It has been a real struggle before, and I will stop at that. But when James came on board, it has been really amazing. And we met actually through two union members, mm -hmm. leaders, Michael Ritter, who's retired now, and Susan Chen, who were both part of that delegation we did to Palestine 2016, the Prisoner Solidarity Academic and Labor Delegation. We have a lot of the stuff online. We've done a whole bunch of reports here. The statement is available on Samidun in multiple languages, Arabic, Spanish. French, German, I don't remember how many others. But anyway, that's available and it's, it's, uh, people were amazing. And like yeah, last night, Claude Frank was, all, Claude Marx was one of them. And also one of the people who was here was Hank Jones, who was in 1968, were part of the Black Panther Party community support for the strike here at San Francisco State. Emery Douglas from the Black Panther Party was also part of this delegation. I'm just going to say that these connections are there. Anyway. James has been really amazing. He organized last semester a very big conference. He co-organized. I shouldn't say he organized, because none of us work alone. We all work together. A very important conference called the New Liberal University. James has been leading us, has been struggling, has really been speaking truth to power. And there is a reason 
why he's here today. It's not just because we want to have our faculty union. It's because this is really a leader that we can stand behind and we can support. And so I'm so honored and I'm so happy that you are here speaking now 50 years later. Um, I'm, I'm not nearly as interesting as the last four speakers, so I'll be very quick. But um, I, uh, I, I actually recently put together another uh, group of strikers. It was uh, Benny Stewart, Ramona Tasco, Penny Nakatsu, and Don Gonzalez, and it was wonderful to meet them. And I said to, I said to them, and I'm going to say the same thing to you, that it's not every day that you meet people who change the world, so it's really an honor to be in your presence. I mean that. I really mean that. Um, uh, so um, I think you already got a little bit of a sense that, um, that this struggle is far from over, and in some ways we have to start all over again. Um, uh, but um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a kind of an update or a current, a current, <laughs> current map. The thing that I've, I've, I've realized, i come to realize about San Francisco State, but I think this is probably true about everywhere, at least in this country, but probably everywhere, is that everything that's born out of struggle is permanently hated by the establishment and they fight it forever. They never, they never accept it. And the way that that fight happens here is always through death by 10,000 cuts. That's the, that's the, that's the method. And, and I know Professor Abdelhadi knows all about that because he's received many, many thousands of cuts. But um, so it's all little things. It's all little bureaucracies, little, this is little microaggressions, little undermining. Um, I guess changing the title to ethnic studies is, yeah. is one of those. Um, we, should, we should talk about ch changing it back. Yeah, uh, we can. Um, <laughs> And, an, and, and another thing just to say kind of as a general statement is like it's great that, you know, the union, I'm so happy that we've been able to help uh, all these situations, but it's not the same as having uh, a unified struggle like with, with, you know, students occupying buildings and, and faculty going on strike. That's a, that's a different thing. So whatever the union can do is kind of band-aids compared to the kind of real power that comes out of, you know, what, what, what these people have, have created. Um, I will say that I'm... Even though this College of Ethnic Studies is not what it was, I am so, so happy that it exists. It's my favorite thing about San Francisco State. It's why I came here. It's the most beautiful thing about San Francisco State. I, I love it. I always tell the administrators, speaking, of, speaking truth to power, why do you treat it like shit? It's the best thing we've got going here. It's, it's what puts us on the map. It's, you know, it, uh, there's, you know, they never have a good answer for that. But um, so it, it's, it's such a beautiful gift that you, that you all gave us. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, so I just wanted to give us a more recent story. So you, you, you probably all know that the, the College of Ethnic Studies has been systematically underfunded for years, and, uh, and, the, and there's a question of <laughs> struggle for positions. And, and, you know, like this year, they had all the new faculty, and the College of Ethnic Studies had nobody. You know, it's, 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 it's death by 10,000 cuts. But um, uh, a few years ago, I, I don't want to tell you stuff you don't already know, but there was, this, there was a, stu a hunger strike. Um, that came, that tried to sort of restore a couple positions and, got, and get some more funding and, and you know, yeah, some of the students are here, well, thank you so much for what you did because again, struggle is the only thing that brings beautiful things to this place mm -hmm. and then after the struggle's finished, then the university kind of tries to dial it back. That, that's the pattern. Um, but one thing that came out of that was the creation of the Black Unity Center. Um, which many of you already know, which is run by Siri McDougall, who is in, in Africana Studies. And it was, it, it's, it's a, it was a beautiful thing. He, he did so much. He got so much done. And then, of course, after one year of this magnificent thing, he was, he was I don't know, I, I, deposed. I, I would say fired. He stepped down. He, he yeah, down. he was forced to step, whatever you want to call it. It was, it, it was to have students teach each other how to become organizers. Um, and you know, and, and 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 continue the struggle. So there's a lot of that still. It's it's still really got that. I, I hope that it stays that way. Um, the person who's running it right now is wonderful, and she's all about struggle. So um, as long as she's in charge, I think we're, we'll be okay. And the, and amazing students, amazing classes. So you guys should also all teach classes to each other and take them. Um, you get credit. It's it's really great. Yeah. And, well, okay. So yes, yeah, so, I mean, that was I was saving the so. <laughs> Uh, Ahmed is, of course, like a particularly uh, oppressed and un unloved by the administration. And, uh, you know, we've been, I, 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 I've been saying for, like, since we've been working on this, just hire two more positions. It'll make, it'll, it'll change everything. Everybody will be happier. It will, it will take this huge load off Professor Abdelhadi, who's been doing the work of 10,000 people. I don't know how you do it. Um, 
And our job is to sustain you, I think. So, you know, we're, we're, because the idea is to exhaust you. And, and I think that in the name of academic freedom, we should all do everything that we can to sustain this beautiful program and, and keep it going. Um, and, uh, and so we, we will continue that. We're not, we're not, we're, I'm not tired. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if we can do it after 50 years, you can do it. You're exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Terry has a. Thank you. One of the things to talk about Ahmed is because Crutchfield, Benny, myself have been coming here talking to all branches of so called quote unquote ethnic studies. Why don't they back her? And the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the thing is, they're afraid. They're afraid. So, uh, to be in my opinion, ain't no goddamn ethnic study. Ain't nothing right now because if they don't back Ahmed, all you, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this should be a strike, a general strike at this state, this college. A general strike. Because if they don't back Ahmed, I mean, at this particular time in history, they're more needed than any black studies, anything that's ever needed. They're catching hell. Constant hell. In fact, they just had a general strike uh, uh, the 1st of October in Jerusalem and in Gaza and in the West Bank, right? Mm -hmm. and the streets are empty, and they catch hell all the time. And as I said, we, back in them days, we thought internationally. All we did is think internationally. And people don't realize it, but the concept of third row came from the BSU. For example, in this here, they had six Latino students and six Mexican students. So our job is to go find more from the mission and bring them on. So basically, what I'm saying, if you don't support Ahmed and, 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 and demand what she and what it has need, this goddamn place ain't worth it being in. This is a waste to come out of here. That don't make no sense. What, what kind of, I, don't, I know time, things have changed. They got you in debt. I mean, they, 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 they make you pay two, three thousand something dollars a semester. I know. They got you come from everywhere. We only had people come from Oakland, Berkeley, a few from Berkeley, uh, San Francisco, and a few from Richmond and Monroe City when we were here. So we all knew each other. We was close. Now they're from everywhere. But I won't say no more. I mean, it's just fact. I, I don't understand why <laughs> nobody was not backing Ahmed. Okay. Yes, I I'd like to, I'd like right. to say, okay. someone asked how you can continue to hope and Sustain how you hope. don't get af afraid. Well, one thing is we talk to each other all the time. You have to have comrades who you trust and who you can talk with, learn from, support. That's really important. And one of the things I learned personally was if you say, this is the only reason I ever liked Jerry Rubin, um, when he went before the HUAC committee in Native American dress and laughed at them, once he laughed at them, they lost their power. If you don't give them the power, that's a start. Because you don't, Sure, you can get, I was targeted every year by the IRS. You know, whoopee shit, I wasn't making any money. You know, um, How about Trump? yeah. Uh, and the first time I started making money, I went and got myself a damn good tax attorney and I told him what was happening. And he went in and oh boy, they didn't hassle me again. But they try to scare you. Uh -huh. They will, they'll try to scare you with anything. But what you have to do is be prepared for it and say, you know, guess what? I won't use that term. Um, I know you have some power, but I have power. Mm -hmm. And we collectively have power. You're not going to be able to organize students coming in to the university to go on strike. It's a long process. You can't expect it to happen overnight. Um, Terry was talking about how the BSU had to get a new leadership and uh, begin to organize itself before it could organize anyone else. 
You've got to speak to the people at their level. Don't come out with some, like, we got to take over and, you know, and don't be stupid enough to take over a building. I mean, talk about getting ca caught. It's like they, the reason they have this building over here, the student union or whatever it's called, because it's a trap. You speak where you're told to speak, and there's no way out if the cops come the other way, is there? It's an absolute trap. Okay. Steve. Well, I, I think, you know, education is critical. I mean, it's like how much money, the militarization of the campuses, how much money is being spent on the police here? You know, we need to do some research. Millions of dollars are going into the militarization of the campuses. We have to get that information out to the students. Why are they paying registration fees for, all, for millions of dollars and then the, poli the police are used to tell people you can't speak at rallies? I mean, that is, you know, what is happening. They want to terrorize the students and the faculty so they're afraid to speak up and organize. So you have to show how that's happening. Uh, you, you need, I believe, a united front, a united front of all different student organizations and groups together for democratic rights, the right to speak out the right to keep the programs that are being attacked. You need a list of demands that all you can unify on and you begin to organize and educate people about those specific demands. That means research committees. I mean, this is what we did on the campus in 68. We had research out about who runs the university. Where's all the money going in the university? They say they don't have money for professors at this program. Where's the money going? You know, that kind of information is we have to get to the students and, and the students, you know, I feel for the students, because as I said, it was not a problem financially for me. But for the students today, it is a problem. If you're a working class student, you're against the wall trying to survive. And we have to say that to the students. There's so much money in the state, you have a right to go for free to college. That has to be a demand. You know, and we have to fight to make that a demand, and it has to be a united front with the staff and the teachers to say we're going to fight and we're going to make it happen. And the students with the faculty and the staff have the power to make it happen. But that requires organization, education, and you know, breaking the, the feeling of people that they can't do anything. They're all by themselves. And that's, yeah, that's right. Let, let me say that the sister said, the comrade said something about that, to make themselves what was again the question about finding a way to keep going, right? Yeah. To keep going. Okay, oh, to sustain yourself. One of the things, for example, they made this to Haiti of the United States. If you want to know about, about Haiti, study the hate about what they did in Haiti. Haiti. The Haitians defeated three military armies, British, French, and Spanish, and they paid for it. They paid for it right now. So this is the Haiti. That's why they've got all these rules you can't go. They don't want to ever see you anybody do what we did before. Now what you do, in my opinion, you get together and do some studying together. You find some comrades, these four or five comrades, and you meet. I mean, right now, when I came out here on the M car, so the second or third time I came on the M car, it was showing everybody on that damn M car had that shit in their ears and goddamn phones, I mean. I mean, it's insane. I mean, they wasn't even talking to each other. They used to call me an agitator, because I used to agitate. And finally, in the 80s, when everybody thought I was crazy, I stopped, but I used to go in on buses and agitate. <laughs> So basically, what, what, what's so important is that get together and have political education classes. We used to have political education classes in the mission and the projects, 20 and 30 people in them. And one of the main things we told them, they had to treat women as equal. And so in them classes, we had big fights because we would made, want to maintain that women would be treated as equal, as comrades. So basically, in my opinion, start studying together. Hook up with people you, you, you're close to and, and, and watch each other's backs. Take care of each other. Check on each other. And another thing, in any struggle, you got to take care of yourself. But a lot of times back in the days, we didn't take care of ourselves. You got to start take care of yourself and, and make so your health, take care of your health. You know what I mean? You got to eat right, at least stay off these goddamn fast food places, huh? Burger King, blim blam, all that and madness. You know what I mean? And start taking care of yourself. So that's basically, I mean, in my opinion, you got to hook up together and, com and, and, and communicate and stay in touch and help each other. And you develop ideology. for my rotator cup, so I'm moving a little slow. Um, one, I brought some of the old documents of what we tried to create. 
Uh, this is administrative timetable when I was adjunct dean. And uh, we had five different programs. They had to get rid of me because I was going to throw out tenure. Because if you're teaching and if 95% of your students flunk, when they go into mainstream political science classes and economic classes, what the hell are you teaching? Mm -hmm. Bullshit rhetoric. Toilet paper thick, one ply thick rhetoric. That wasn't what we were about. If you're talking about sustaining and you believe, because I've been in meetings where I've been the only one in the goddamn meeting. Don't look for instant success. You keep plotting. Keep going, as Terry said. When we, when I, 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 we had study groups, and you studied, and you'd be surprised that that group, the special admissions group, 66 percent of us graduated, and 50 percent of us went on to get advanced degrees. I lost it uh, last semester over there, at, and and. A little blood, uh, uh, had a little bullshit formula on the board, having some abstract theory about graduation. And they're bragging about business department 2.8% graduation. Are you serious? I can do math. Does 66 sound bigger than 2.8? And then I had some of the little undergraduate want to challenge me. So you can go call the dean a liar. That's his numbers there that he just came up with. Um, <clears throat> please don't ever give up. I always think back how my family uh, came to California from Louisiana. Because after the hurricane, my parents, my mother's side of the family were sharecroppers. And the whites started hanging all the black males so they couldn't rebuild the farms. So that don't ever give up. You keep going, working with each other, and it's like, understand the game of education. And it is a game under this capitalist uh, system. They make you starve for the masters. Uh, if you have creative and functional ideas, then some of, you can get money for your doctorate. And that part of your doctorate can be your masters. Sit now and decide where you want to go as an undergrad. Where's your heart at? What do you love? And be creative in the development. We need thinkers, not followers. Our people have been known for creativity and innovation, as reflected in this group of thinking. Out of necessity, out of necessity. And that I'm. I'm my frustration with the current department here, and at, I'm not for cultural nationalism. It's more of cultism, and, uh, and it, we have never seen it grow. We evolved from a cultural nationalist movement to an internationalist movement in seeing our relationships and talking to each other, not at each other. You can't go around screaming, ah, you fucked up and you didn't do what you spoke. That ain't going to cut it. You're not going to go in the community. People smack you upside your head. That's what, or if you're shot, talking crazy. Talk to each other. Like Terry said, I, people in their own little world, not even talking, got the earphones. I'm at the restaurant, and it's like, they're just texting. They don't even talk to each other when having dinner. Shit, I'm sorry, I'm old school. I'm spending the money. We going to dinner. We going to talk. <laughs> Shit, what you mean? You're going to just, <laughs> this lack of humanity, your distance from, among all the other bullshit, you get, get caught up in the substitution of technology for humanity, for a humane treatment of each other. And it starts with you. You got to talk to each other. I don't know, do y'all still have parties? <laughs> I, when I left, when I stepped down from my old days, I'd, I'd smack the shit out of the faculty. Instead, I threw a party. Terry was there. I had over 300 people. It was like uh, uh, I had a party in my house. Every room had a spot. The living room was for the squares. Uh, the, the, well, they were by the fireplace and stuff. Now, and then you had the shit talkers were playing bid whisk and dominoes in my business office. 
Then you had the pseudo-intellectuals who thought they were heavy, the chess players, they were in the den. <laughs> then you had everybody buy the food. I got pictures of it, you can see. And then my cousin bought a portable studio. So like my house was like two houses slapped together. Everybody was partying down. I had to kick everybody out of my house by around 5.30. It's like the John Doyle parties during the strike when we kicked everybody out. Have those social activities. That's how build relationships with each other. Uh, I'm getting on a plane to go see my buddy uh, Slim, who was chairman after me uh, in Nebraska. In Omaha, right? It's in, yeah, it's, it's in Omaha. Of all places. It is, you know? After they ran us out. They ran us right back in the Black Panther Party's arms, right? And we caught hell. Yeah. <laughs> but they've stayed here trying to We keep stayed, them. and that, like you're saying, yes, they had, FBI had a camera by my apartment, and I just wave on Randolph Street where the streetcar runs. Hey, what's going on? We tear it down. They come put another one up. And you know, you ain't stopping shit. They hired somebody else just to watch me. And like when I was VP, I'm going to steal the money and buy guns. Yeah, we created the child care center. And we expanded and pushed for an MA here in black studies. You keep going. And when I came back, I'm pushing for a PhD. It's that you keep putting innovating and going forward what your community needs are. Develop your relationship with your community, and that gives a direction. I'm, instead of being at the Navy, I came here today because I felt you were far more important than me go argue with the Navy about the radiation issues. I'll, say, I'll get them on the 23rd of January. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to also, I think, uh, Jim, James, well, I want to also say a couple of things. One is that you, somebody, I think it was Cass asking about how do you build momentum. And I think Terry uh, mentioned some of it. I also want to bring some of the context of the class that we're in. So, for example, there is two issues I was thinking about. One is the Arab revolutions. And when the Arab revolutions broke, everybody was thinking there is spontaneous. There is always this discussion about spontaneous. This is the same thing also that came up when defend and advance ethnic studies happened. This is the same thing that happened with the Intifada in 87 when people were saying, why is it, oh, it already broke up. And this has to do with kind of like not understanding history and not thinking about all the sustained discussion and organizing that is going on for a very long time. And then at one point, you see something break out, and then people think this is what happens because the observation is only about the moment, and it only looks about the, the, the present, and it doesn't really look about the history. So if you think about the Arab revolutions in Egypt, for example, workers have been striking and striking and striking. The Egyptian regime has been like oppressing and torturing people in prison and so on. And people have been organizing. We're organizing. Actually, it's very interesting. We, you want to think about orga organizing across borders is one of the things that the Egyptian organizers in Tahrir Square told us on the first anniversary of the revolution. We were there on to January 25th, 2012. And it broke out in January, right? 2012, yeah. And they were, every single one of them, they said that they actually got a lot of their training. We did a lot of oral history um, interviews. They said they got a lot of their training in 2000 when the Palestinian Aqsa Intifada broke out. And they started organizing because while the Egyptian regime was trying to silence them, they could not publicly say that they are going to suppress demonstrations in support of Palestinian people whose rights have been violated. So they couldn't do that. So in the process of organizing in support of Palestinians who are being crushed day in and day out by the Israeli, and, and September 28th was actually the anniversary of the 2000 Intifada when Ariel Sharon went into the Aqsa Mosque with shoes and dogs and soldiers. And, and uh, it was also, again, it was the spark. Okay. The same thing with the 1987. It was a, a, a and you and some of you have read this in the class. It was the bus. It was the, 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 the tanker that was in Gaza that killed four workers. But it wasn't just the, it wasn't. That was the spark that actually, if you think about the Russian Revolution in 1917, which was 100th anniversary, they said the iskra, the spark that hit, was one thing, but actually it was years of building and building and building. So there is sustained resistance going on. What you're talking about, the resistance to the time, place, and manner, students coming to events of this sort, students organizing, the stuff that you do on Malcolm X Plaza, the choking, the, the, the I'm choking the CH, a 
L K Cho King, not Cho King. So, so my English is not my accent is not. So all of this stuff actually builds. It builds. So that I think this is really important to think about that. That it's not something that just happens. It doesn't just happen. The other thing is there is a big debate, and I know there is a debate among all of you and among all of us about the question of organization about whether you need hierarchical, you need uh, uh, horizontal. There is something that students are going, and I'm more than happy to have this because I have this views about it, some of you know. okay. And we can talk about that. But I think this is some of the things that we actually really need to look into. And we need to, when I, whenever we're studying a subject, we need to also look. Like we're studying Palestine. We also need to look at social movements. We also need about transnational organizing. We need about all various ways of actually thinking about where things intersect with each other. And I'm not talking about intersectionality, the way the word is being used every single day. That is not really what Kimberly Crenshaw may, meant when she wrote her article. Like every Everybody thinks everything is intersectional and they think this is a catchphrase. So I'm kind of like, I don't want to oversimplify. I don't think people are dumb. I think people are quite smart. And people in the communities are quite smart and they understand exactly what's going on. Robin Kelly, when we were in Palestine at the Teaching Palestine Conference, he said something that I find it like it captured a lot of things that we were talking about. He said that when uh, scholars, black scholars, said that people have been, this is what's going on in the black community. They were not themselves saying that this is what's going on. They were translating what's happening in the communities and capturing that analysis and saying, and putting it in academic language. Because this is the job of academics. This is the job of the scholars. So we also need to be a little bit humbled about how much <laughs> originality and how much stuff we're producing and so on. So I think that's really important. The second thing that I thought about is the question of the Canary Mission. The Canary Mission, and it's not really just about the Canary Mission. Canary Mission is supposed to be a shadowy organization that basically exposes all the people. And by the way, Canary is not about the Canary in the mine. It's about the Canary in the Israeli Mossad. Uh, uh, you know, that they called one, one operation canary operation, okay? So that's, that doesn't go about the canary in the mission. So it's not really whistleblowers. It's actually suppression, okay? But I think this, is, this really speaks to what's going on here with San Francisco State and what's going on with the reason why we are being silenced. Why am I being silenced? Was Palestinian organizing being silenced? Why we're being criminalized? Why we are being accused falsely of... Uh, being anti-Semitic in order to silence any discussions of Zionism or uh, criticism of Israel and so on. And part of it also what happens is that some people are afraid and some people also get co-opted. I mean, some people are also offered certain things and so on. And sometimes people don't want to fight. It's not only don't know how to fight. They actually know exactly what they need to do. And they decide not to do it. Because sometimes people decide that I'm going to play along with the system. I'm not going to, you know. And so I think, I think what Margaret has said about the whole question of actually thinking about reframing the question. They throw a question at you. You don't have to accept the question. You can actually ask and say, I don't, this is not the question I want to answer. This is your question. But it's not my question. This is not what the center of my analysis. This is the center of your analysis that uh, actually employs and is based on perpetuating oppression. And I'm not, this is not, this is not what I'm concerned. This is your concern, not my concern. This is what my concern. And One, be two, three, sure four. you have the facts and right. knowledge to back yourself up. Words. I want to just say one more thing about the College of Ethnic Studies. No, I want to say I do agree with you, James, and I'm very happy that we have a College of, I'm very happy that we have a College of Ethnic Studies, and I don't think we would have been here if we didn't have a college, not only in this room today and being able to offer these classes, we would have never been all of this stuff happening if we did not have a College of Ethnic Studies. If the people who are here did not, and there is people in the audience as well, did not actually participate in the struggle that you participated in 68. It would not. If they had not broken the ceiling of fear and they have moved on, we would not have been here. That is really, really, I mean, that's really, really important. On the first page of the lawfare lawsuit is the attack on ethnic studies. 1968, mm -hmm. attempts to decolonize the, the curriculum. Actually, really, this is an argument. There is an argument and a chapter by, um, uh, by Tammy Benjamin, who is uh, the co-founder of the Amcha Initiative, which is one of the, you know, the, she gets paid like over $300,000 by many people who are also funding the, the, the Canary uh, Mission, by many people who are funding all of this construction around San Francisco State. So it's like it's very, very, you know, and it's not, by the way, just to be put it out there, it's not just Jewish money. So people are kind of like this whole construction 
conspiratorial anti-Semitic stuff. That's not what it is. There is actually coalition of interest it's that is coming up. It is about <laughs> it's capitalism and neoliberalism. It's a right-wing agenda. It's an agenda to actually silence people. So what they are, what they, what they, what that, what has, so they, they are actually attacking all of this stuff about decolonizing the curriculum, studying the things, because we're not only studying the experience of our communities, we're actually studying everything. We study the Eurocentric science, we study that, we critique it, we study the things about, we study everything, and it's a lot to do, but we do it. I think one of the problems is that it is not enough to do something great and stop at that. I think that's the problem. It's not enough to pat ourselves on the shoulder and use that as an excuse to stop and say, this is, we are here, and that's OK. It's not OK. It's not OK. The question is, are we going to uphold ourselves to the indivisibility of justice, or are we going to get progressive except on Palestine? I mean, that's really the question is, are we going to say, because there is a very right-wing attack against Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims, and there is a rising Islamophobia, and there is a construction of our communities as terrorists, Terrorists in particular, okay, waiting to explode and so on. Is that going to be a way, is it an excuse to actually be silent and suppress this? It's just a question for people to choose. I mean, people decide whatever they want to do, but I really think, and then the question I think one guy said about the faculty, there is real threats. I mean, there are real threats. There are physical threats. There are uh, email threats. There are threats to the livelihood. There are threats to the careers. There is all sorts of threats that are going on day in and day out. We can discuss them all. And you know, I've written a lot about them. So I, uh, I, want, to, I want us to talk about what's happening here. Okay, But I think it's really. I think we need to keep challenging ourselves. The same way we challenge our students and we keep saying, you need to learn more. It's not OK. It's not OK to say, I know everything. and I'm No, you really need to go more, and you need to push yourself more. Finally, it's not an individual thing. I mean, each one of you can do whatever you want, but it's structural as well. So there is a structure that perpetuates certain things that we really need to kind of like challenge and hold people accountable and say, you know, you really need to stand up to what you, what, what you believe in. Okay, Jamie. I just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, one is I, 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 I neglected to give a little shout out to Amaro here, who is uh, an intern in the union at the Student for Quality Education and absolutely wonderful and gives me hope for your generation because you, you, you and Mara Posa are fabulous. <laughs> Um, yes, and I, I so I mean, the, I mean, the, the larger point is that I think your generation is just as radical as as you were in in your time, and so every all everything, all the ingredients are there, like everything that you need, uh, you know, is, is there, and and you guys are, know what you're doing, and 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 it's it's really exciting. The other thing I was going to say is um, it's important to remember that the right feels fear and despair as well. Like it's not just the left that feels those things, and. And the right can actually be discouraged. And I thank God for the Antifa because I think they've they put a little fear into the right these days. Um, so I hope continue what they're doing. And so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on right now. We're not in a, we're not in a, despite the fact that I think the SF state, but also the whole the whole like machine of capitalism has learned from you guys and tried and spent like the last 50 years trying to make sure it never happens again. Um, the left is learning and adapting too. So it's not it's not just this stasis like where one side does, has all the power and one doesn't. I, I think they're very they're very afraid, and I think that's oh, yeah. it's good to remember that we can be scary too. And Khomeini used this picture to say how America treats its citizens. Now in the movie On Strike, Shut It Down, that's in the library, it has been edited. This whole episode and scene of Big Mac getting jumped on has been cut out. Right. Didn't even think black students were that major role in the strike with the cutbacks. So the literature and the films, beware people, have that critical eye, be that critical thinker, because it has been edited to give a distorted perspective on it. So do you do diligence and research? All, all, all history is revised. For you. And History is revised. Another for the people who haven't spoken. And thank you, thank you. Is yeah, one person, yeah. Your name? My name is George Wright. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, political science at Cal State Chico for about 34 years. Okay. And taught at uh, Skyline College for about eight years. And uh, I, I've known Margaret for a long time. And uh, I just want to say a few things. This is just my take on what everybody else has said here. Uh, related, uh, first of all, I want to say, 
that we were protesting at Chico State before Berkeley or San Francisco State, okay? I just want to, in 64. I just want to say that, okay? All right. Uh, I, I think what's important is it, when you're studying and you're struggling is to develop an, an, an analysis, okay? You have to have a framework of analysis. And that analysis basically is about the relationship between the between capitalism, its relationship to politics, and the role that ideology or narratives play in the perpetuation of the status quo. I think that's the key thing. Based on that framework, I think there are two things we have to understand, is that um, the structure has shifted from the 60s to the present. We've lived through this over the last 40, 50 years. The structure has moved from an industrial-based national development model to a globalized capitalist model that is based on speculation rather than investment in production, which creates jobs, okay? That's very important. The politics has moved, the center of politics has moved to the right, okay? And I say this to anybody that's willing to listen to it, that Richard Nixon's domestic policies are far to the left of Obama's domestic politics. We have to remember that, okay? Okay, yes. And the ideology has shifted as well. This is a little more complicated. When we were up, it was New Deal liberalism, or I like to use corporate liberalism, and it shifted to neoliberalism, which is, uh, you know, it's the survival of the fittest, and the market is good, and the state is bad. And that's ridiculous, okay? The, second, the next point I want to make, yes, okay, one more point, that where we are today is a historical conjuncture that is very, very significant. The world is in transition on a global level, and that can be looked at on ideological, political, and economic levels. The two interrelated aspects of that conjuncture is a severe crisis of, um, of capitalism, and this has to do with the exhaustion of the ability to accumulate capital on the part of the capitalist system. Right. That is why we're, they're privatizing education. That is why the cost of education is so expensive. That's why housing is so expensive in the Bay Area et cetera, et cetera. They're trying to find new ways to make profit at the expense of everybody else, okay? okay. The, I, the second important point is the crisis of imperialism. The U.S. is in rapid decline economically with the rise of China and Russia as new competitor states to the United States. And so you can't believe either the Republicans or the Democrats when they say Russia is bad, okay? Or Russia and meddle in the election. That's a game they're playing to justify military confrontation, which means nuclear war with, down the line with Russia and China. So we have to have a framework to know where we're at. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. That was, you know, it was very hard for me to come to Black Stuff because you're actually living in another class. <laughs> I, I, think there are, I think there are a lot of professors here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I see the students going like this. Okay, yeah. students, okay, 30 seconds. No more. I'm not going to be, allow people to have, even if people get upset with me. So <laughs> students can tell me if they want to say something. If you don't want to say something, is anybody yes? No? Okay. I'm going to give people our, like final comments. 30 seconds each, please. <laughs> because it should be the words. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. It was. Right, 30 I'm watching it. Okay. It was a privilege. It really brings joy to my heart to come here and speak to you and try and explain some of the things that motivated us. And you, that's why I'm still engaged in this type of activity in terms of using the sciences, in terms of trying to save lives, as I've done throughout the world. Keep the work up. Thank you. Thank you. See, uh, us elders, for example, I am an elder. I qualify as an elder. 
and sooner or later I'm going to check out. <laughs> so basically, I'd like for, you know, anybody, anytime anybody wants to talk to me in any way, uh, say, well, I could, I'll try to be as clear and make sense, try to make sense. And but so uh, see, all I can say, uh, you know, we elders, we're going to check out sooner or later. You know, the people have the power. And young people have tremendous creativity and genius. What we did can be replicated. I mean, you are the future. Young people are the future of this world, not just this country. And young people want to change. And they have great spirit. And, you know, I am very optimistic. And because people are waking up, and the people who really run this university and run the world know that. That's why they're so afraid. That's why the police and the repression. They wouldn't be doing that unless they were afraid that the people are going to rise up and start to take control of things. And we have to do that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm just going to say this in Spanish because it has a better <laughs> feeling. El pueblo unido, ya va a OK? You have to unite together, read together, study together, watch each other's back. And in doing so, you will find your own way of organizing the particular community that is here on campus now. I'm an old lady. I don't know what's going on here anymore. You do. So try to take some lessons from us, but realize you are going to have to create your own history. Um, I'm just going to say, it's, a, it's again, it's really an honor to be in the same room with you, with all four of you. So that's, that's all I'm going to say.